<laughs> okay. This is steganography, hide in plain sight. So, to get things started, here's two images. Terminator 1, Terminator 2. They look the same. Yes? Yes, no? Yes. They look the same. One of them has a secret message in it. Can you tell which one it would be? One on the left. The one on the left. Well, that's one possibility. Um, now, let me show you something else just to show you that I'm not pulling your leg. There's a... <clears throat> oh, it's not in the field of view. Let's see. Let's drag this over, and uh, let's see. Okay, um, <clears throat> there's a directory listing. <clears throat> Terminator 1, 6300 bytes. Terminator 2, roughly 1100 bytes, 11,000 bytes. And the time of day. They are different. <coughs> Any guesses to which one has the secret message in it? Dr. Terminator 2. Yeah. Pardon? 2. 2? Okay. That's what I wanted you to say. <laughs> because I specifically rigged it so that it looked that way. Oh, it's got a secret message in it. It must be the bigger one. Right. It's the secret message in it. It's the one with the later timestamp. No. In fact, it's actually the first one. And, compression. Pardon? Different compression. Um, the program I used to create the one with the secret message does some tricks and does some compression on the side. Um, to to fool prying eyes like that. Okay. And let's see. Let's go back. Tell you what, let's um, having two screens is a little bit of a problem. Okay, there's my cursor. Let's back it down a little bit. I used a program called Steg Suite to put the secret message in. You open it. Oops. Is that a commercial program? No, this is free software. Okay. What's the program called again? Steg Suite. S T E G S U I T E. App Get Install Steg Suite. If you're on Ubuntu. Okay. Uh, let's see, where did I put it? Pictures. JPEG. Terminator 1. Now, what you can do is you can password protect it. <laughs> yes. I'll be back. You can embed it or you can extract it. And we hit extract and it says the secret message is send lawyers, guns, and money. Any problem can be solved with those three in combination. But yes, this is how simple steganography can be. Have a nice GUI, you can uh, type in, a, you can have a password that's required to be able to take it out. And you can't tell which one is which, which one is the, the, the prying eyes can't easily discern it because it's smaller than the original, so that, and it, I, I fudge the dates to make it look that way. But that's, that's the general idea. Um, and if steganography is proof that seeing is not necessarily believing. So did you fudge the timestamp as well? Um, 
Well, what I did is I took the original and then copied that after I had made the oh, steg file. I copied the original to another name, deleted the original, and then moved the moved that copy back to the other back to the original name, so that it had a later timestamp. Yes, sir. Say I used that to embed copyright information in photos I wanted to publish but not have stolen. Mm -hmm. Are there ways they could still take the photos and not have that information available if, the, if it was re-downloaded? So, I mean, they could get around it? So oh, get around the, 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 the copyright, copyright information yes. embedded? Yes. Um, no, the copyright information it would be very hard to pull for them to, to pull out. That's the whole idea behind steganography is that the message is dispersed throughout the file so that you can't tell that it's there. But yes, so you could use this for copywriting photos. Um, okay. All this good stuff, that's who I am, that's where I work, that's my email address. All that good stuff. Um, I do need to put up a disclaimer because this is dealing with issues of privacy and there are certain governments around the world, certain regimes, that do not like for their uh, citizenry to have uh, high-level encryption and be able to do that. Um, if you do not use this for, this is for your informational purposes. Um, if you use it for illegal purposes, uh, you're on your, as, as the preacher says, in Blazing Saddles, son, you're on your own. <laughs> okay. Uh, so steganography. What is it? Well, that's a great name. Steganography comes from two Greek words. It comes from the word steganos, meaning covered or hidden. Graphos, meaning write. So steganography is hidden writing. Uh, it can be very simple, and it has run the gamut throughout history. It could be invisible ink on paper, or a copyright stuck into an audio file by, the, by Sony or whoever. Um, steganography has really come into its own now that um, we have digital stuff. We have audio files, we have digital pictures, um, but steganography has a, a very uh, long history. And since the Greeks probably invented it, uh, and of course the Greeks invented a lot of things like democracy, trigonometry, geography, um, they, and all of those wonderful names, um, it ends up being a Greek name. So, here's a good question for you. Why would you want to use steganography over encryption? Well, encryption takes a file, say, a file of text, and turns it into ciphertext, which if you plot the frequency of the characters by how often they occur, it's a flat line. So you can't tell what characters are being used more and use that to break the, break the encryption. Also, encryption is... Um, uh, used a lot by banks, it's used by governments, um, but a lot of countries, like I said, don't like for um, their populace to be able to use encryption, and it's outlawed. Um, so, um, <clears throat> what's the, why would you want to use steganography over cryptography alone? Well, it's pretty obvious if something's been encrypted because it looks like junk. Um, but steganography, on the other hand, as you've seen, there's a secret message embedded in one of those files, and you couldn't, you could look at it, and you couldn't tell that it was there. So, um, you can use steganography and encryption together, rather than just sticking plain text into an image, you could encrypt your message and then put that encrypted message into the image and then send the image off. So you can use them in concert together. Um, now, the, the good thing about steganography 
is it protects both the messages and the communicating parties because to prying eyes it looks like they're just sending pictures of cats back and forth for instance um, is steganography being used at all today or is this just an academic exercise here are some recent headlines about steganography January 24th 2019 a joint report from two groups looked at the techniques used by this malvertising operation and they're now using poisoned images hidden in with, by steganographic means another one cyber criminals are now using steganography to distribute powerful obfuscated PDF files to compromise targets and evade detection because it looks just like a normal PDF would um, here's another one February 9th, February 8th cyber criminals are now distributing this particular Ersniff malware through office documents with PowerShell scripts to bypass <coughs> normal detection so yes steganography is being used more and more it's now being it's now fallen into the into the realm of cyber criminals so uh, it's going to be used even more um, let's look at a little bit of, of history of steganography uh, as I said steganography is based on two Greek words uh, so the Greeks probably invented it before anybody else um, one Greek ruler um, Hestius had a method for doing steganography uh, when he wanted to send a secret message he would take a slave shave his head tattoo the message onto the head of the slave and then wait for the hair to grow out and then send the slave over to where he needed to go the slave gets to where he needs to go presents himself his head is shaved and they read the message now this is going to be slow but <laughs> things moved slower back in ancient Greece than they do today um, but uh, pardon? you can't reuse them either well um, that depends on how big your message is and how big the head of the slave is but, but the slave you, you know what the, they would then do is they got a slave with a, sla with a shaved head so they tattoo the reply on, wait for the hair to grow out and send him back to the sender. That, that works. Um, like I say, it's a bit slow, but things, things didn't move at a necessarily a fast pace in ancient Greece like they do today. Um, there's another interesting stego method that was, that was come up with. Um, the Greeks, of course, and the Romans, and the Egyptians, they didn't have paper. They had parchment and vellum, but that was used for, that was expensive. And they, they, used, they used that for only important stuff. But what they had were wax tablets. And the wax tablet was basically a flat piece of wood with a uh, case around it that they would fill with wax. And then they would write on the wax and do whatever they wanted with it. Uh, and they were very reusable. They were very recyclable because you just put it out in the sun, the wax gets soft, and you buff it up, and you're all set to go. Now what one uh, ruler decided to do was on that, that plank, he cut a message into that plank, and then built the frame around it, filled it with wax, and now the message was completely hidden because it was covered by the wax. So when it got to the sender, it got to the recipient, all they had to do was break the wax off and read what was on the plank. Um, the Chinese also had steganography. Now they had silk, and what they would do is they would write the message on the piece of silk, encase it in, in a ball of wax, and then the, the, the slave or whoever would swallow the ball of wax. Um, now, I, I, I leave it to your imagination as to how they got the wax ball back. There's at least two methods. 
Yeah, I thought, yes, I know of at least two methods, but my research wouldn't tell me which one it was. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, yeah, um, I couldn't find out what the preferred method was. I know if I had to swallow the bloody thing, I know which one I would prefer. But anyway, um, steganography, as you might imagine, is very popular in war. Um, and it's used been extensively in war. Uh, for example, in the American Revolution, the British and the Americans used uh, um, invisible ink made from various different substances to transmit messages back and forth. And they used naturally occurring stuff like lemon juice, milk, and urine. You put those over lightly over a flame and they will turn dark. And if, you've, um, if you saw the movie National Treasure, uh, they, they show that, that sort of thing. Uh, so there's a, that's one way to do it, using uh, natural chemicals like that. Um, but with time going on, um, they got much better at generating um, uh, inks and developers that you could write, write the secret message in and then um, swipe something across it and reveal the secret message. So there was this big arms race, if you will, between trying to develop the, the ink and the developer and the, the counter ink on, on both sides. Um, now in World War II, uh, the Germans being very good at photography and chemistry came up with the idea of microdots. They would take the piece of information and successively shrink it down to the size of a period, put that on a piece of, on an, a uh, seemingly harmless piece of paper, and then deliver that by whatever mechanism. Um, a quote from J. Edgar Hoover about microdots, he claimed it was the inner enemy's masterpiece of espionage. Um, we didn't know about it until a uh, tipster, a double agent, said, watch out for the dots. Lots and lots of little dots. But, uh, once microdots became known publicly, uh, they were used a great deal in spy novels and spy movies during the 50s and 60s. Um, another example of steganography in war is what are called null ciphers. Null ciphers encrypt messages inside of plain text. Um, it's hard to determine that there is a real message hidden inside it because it looks just like ordinary text. I have an example for you. Um, up here at the top. Fishing, freshwater bins, and saltwater coast rewards anyone feeling stressed, resourceful anglers usually find masterful leapers fun and admit swordfish rank overwhelming any day. It looks like something out of field and stream, but yet there is a special message encoded in it. If you take the third letter of each word from the message, and I have it bolded and underlined, you get the secret message. Send lawyers, guns, and money. It looks normal. It looks like plain old tech. Like I say, it looks like something you'd see in field and stream. But we have we've not used anything fancy digitally. We've not used any kind of uh, heavy algorithms. But we have managed to encode within ordinary text a text message that is important. What's uh, Governor uh, Schwarzenegger sent the legislator, le California legislature, a letter mm -hmm. telling him his displeasure over some legislation. And it was all a line left on the margin, but if you read the letters vertically in that first column, it said F U <laughs> spelled yeah. out. Yeah. Um, there there's um, that that there's actually a name for that. Um and um, it's called an acrostic, A-C-R-O-S-T-I-C, -O -O um, where the letters along the front spell something, 
Um, and there's actually a special form of it in English called the acrostic sonnet, where it's the sonnet of, uh, sonnets are of course 14 lines, and what's along the, the first letter along the lines spells a message or something. Um, they're, they're very hard to write because you only have 14, 14 lines to deal with. <laughs> But yeah, that's that's called acrostic. And a lot of uh, Jewish religious poems have acrostics. Yes, yes, that, that's also true. Yep. Um, so um, modern methods, since we've now got digital stuff that we can we can hide, um, the most common way of hiding something in steganography is what's called least significant bit substitution. <clears throat> it turns out the human eye is rather insensitive to minor variations in pictures. Um, most pictures are encoded on 255 bits, uh, I'm sorry, on, on 8 bits, which gives you 255 possi 256 possibilities. So they will use that last bit, the low order bit, to change it throughout the word file, the, 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 the uh, sound file, the picture file, to encode the message. Um, uh, it alters it, but um, not, not really that much that we can tell, as you saw by the, the, those two images. Um, I have an example. Here's just a bit stream from, from a file, and I've underscored the least significant bit in there. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to encode the letter G in that stream. And now you see what, what I've changed. Now it turns out that I've only changed half of those least significant bits to encode G. So that ends up being really, really minor because I'm only changing the least significant bit. I've only changed half of them. So you can use the LSB technique, the least significant bit, to um, encode stuff. Um, and you're saying half because they were already set. They were already set to the right. They were already set to the same value as, as the encoding for G. Um, so um, let's look at, at, at another technique. There's insertion. Um, anybody ever looked really closely at a PDF file? Okay. But at the very start of it, you have a, uh, a magic sequence that identifies it as a PDF file. Percent, percent PDF and a version number. And then at the very end, you have percent, percent EOF. That signifies the end of it. So your PDF viewer looks to see at the very beginning, yeah, this is a PDF file. And it keeps reading until it hits that percent percent EOF and doesn't read any further. So what you can do is hide something at the end of your PDF file and your PDF viewer doesn't know any different because it only reads as far as the EOF, but you can hide stuff after it. If you look very carefully at a PDF document, you'll find that there are beginning and ending regions within the PDF file. And you can stick stuff in there, too. Um, <clears throat> there is a modern-day equivalent of invisible ink. Take a create your document in whatever document format or program you, you happen to like, uh, LibreOffice, OpenOffice, Word, whatever, and make it double-spaced. Put your secret message on all the even lines, then go back and change the character color from black to white. Mm -hmm. So now you have masked out your secret message. Somebody reads it, they just see a double spaced document. The modern day equivalent of invisible ink. Um, but yeah, you can insert, insert stuff within documents. Um, but uh, PDF is, is a good example of how you can hide stuff by just sticking it at the end. Um, another technique that's, that's pretty good is um, you take the original document and 
um, if a bit is zero, you make it red. If it's a one, you make it blue. So you end up with this picture of your document that looks like modern art because it's all, all shady stuff. And now your document is encrypted. It, it, it is, is uh, not, um, uh, uh, has been steganized. And it looks just like a piece of modern art. Um, there, there's another interesting technique. Um, there's this great program called Spam Mimic. About 50% of the traffic on the internet today is spam. It's just clogs up the internet. So, and, and everybody gets lots of spam in their, in their stuff, in their email every day. What Spam Mimic does is it takes your secret message and encapsulates it with junk so that it looks like a spam message. And generally speaking, spam messages have pretty awful grammar and words in them anyway. So it is very hard to tell something that spam mimic turns out from real spam. Um, yeah, uh, try spam mimic, just Google for it. Um, some programs that do steganography. Steghide is a fairly old one. And it uses um, quite a few. It uses both picture files and sound files. And it does the, it uses the LSB technique of flipping the least significant bits on and off. Um, there's the basic syntax. You want to tell it, steg hide, I want to embed my, uh, in my, my file that I want to encrypt and the image that I want to put it into. And uh, it will ask you for a passphrase. You don't want to put a passphrase, you can just hit a character turn. Um, but that passphrase will have to be known by the recipient so that they can decrypt the file. Um, an example, I want to encrypt my, I want to encode my secret message into my Mona Lisa JPEG. To get it back, I extract from whatever my image file name is, um, and if there's a password, it will ask you for the password. That's one. Um, does anybody remember um, Cicada 3301 from a while back? This was this was a uh, this was a hunt game that was going on across the internet. Um, this group called Cicada 3301 would post clues and uh, you would try to solve the clues and each clue would point to the next clue. Um, they used a program called Outguess. They used Outguess, which is free software. It came from FreeBSD. Um, that's how they posted their first challenge was using the Outguess program. Um, now, Outguess is really clever. Outguess looks at the file that you're going to put the secret message into and tries to figure out how much you can put into it. Uh, and it uses some clever techniques so that you can't really statistically try to uh, run some analysis on it and determine that now, maybe there's a steganographic file in there or not. Uh, according to its author, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, Outguess is considered undetectable. At least that's what he claims. I'll have a little bit more about that in a minute or two. Um, Outguess, whatever file you want to put it into, the image name that you want to put it into, and then the output file. Um, you can, of course, give it a secret key that you want to apply to it to increase your security. There's an example. Outguess, my secret key is Gorgon. I'm going to put this text into the Mona Lisa JPEG and it's going to go into new Mona Lisa JPEG. When your recipient wants to decrypt it, pretty much the same thing. Outguess, the name of the key, 
and I'm going to read the JPEG file, and I'm going to stick the secret message into the secret message file. Now, we've seen an example of one GUI program. We all like GUIs. Who doesn't? Um, there's another one called Steg GUI, and it's a front end to Steg Hide that allows you to uh, encrypt, uh, put a secret message into a carrier file. Um, and it has an interesting feature that it embeds a text editor in there too. Um, there's a new one on the scene that looks very interesting and promising that I played a little bit with called Dark JPEG. It's actually a web application. Uh, it allows you to uh, embed a file or a piece of mess or a message into um, a uh, into an image file or a way or a sound file. Um, but the interesting thing about it is is that uh, it gives you plausible deniability. If so that um, let me move ahead. If you were pressured by uh, a government entity that was unfriendly to you, you could say, well, yeah, I did put a secret message in there, and here's the, here's the secret key to get it out, and they do that, and they find that it says, you know, uh, mayonnaise, carton of milk, butter, and eggs. And they go, well, this isn't so great. But your real message is still in there, and they don't know it. So it gives you some plausible deniability. Um, great. All these wonderful ways of, of hiding stuff through steganography. What about detecting it? Well, that's, as, as the English poet said, that's where the rub comes in. Uh, it is very hard to detect steganography because the basic fundamental quality of it is you want it to be undetectable. Um, now, um, you may be able to detect, I don't have slides for this, but I'll talk about it real quickly. You may be able to detect steganography through indirect means. For instance, um, let's say that you're given a forensic image of a disk drive and you start performing a forensic an analysis on it and you find uh, in the pictures directory there are all of these pictures of uh, the same cat but they all have different sizes and they all have different MD5 checksums. Well that's a pretty good clue that something bizarre is going on here. Why is it that all of the same picture of this cat is all different sizes and have different checksums? Well that, that looks pretty bizarre. Um, by the same token um, if they have installed steganographic software, in particular if it's a Windows system, there are going to be lots and lots of footprints that they have done it. There will be registry keys, there will be link files, there will be pointers in iocache.db. Uh, um, if they have done this on a Linux system, there will be, tra there will be traces in the in the app directory. If they're using RPMs, there will be stuff stuck away in the yum cache. Um, for as far as executing it goes, uh, there will be traces of it being um, executed in uh, the the um, um, in, in the last file on on, on Linux. Um, so there are indirect ways that you can tell that somebody has been using steganography. Um, but actually detecting it, well, like I say, that, that's a difficult problem because the goal is to uh, not be detectable. So, um, cryptanalysis, it's pretty obvious when you've got something that's being <coughs> encrypted. And you, you know when something is probably being encrypted. We knew that the German high command was sending stuff to the submarine commanders and vice versa. Okay, no, no big deal. But um, knowing that 
German spies in the U.S. during World War II were getting secret messages, um, that, that was much harder to detect. Um, so, um, steganography is the process of putting a secret message in. Steganalysis is the process of determining that there is a secret message. And, as you might well guess, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. Um, first one, you've only got the medium, <coughs> the, the piece of data that you think may have steganography applied to it. This may be the sound file or the audio file that somebody has emailed to somebody or given them through a USB stick or something like that. Now, if you're really lucky, you may have the original file that they used. Well, that's great, because now you know something about the original file, its size and its general makeup, and you've got the file that they sent. So you're, you're much better off. You have a better chance. Um, another trick that you can do is if you've got the file and you've got the media, you, you know what the message is. So you may be lucky enough to be able to figure out how they got the message in there and that they would use a similar technique the next time they do this. Um, if you know the algorithm that they used, you may be able to pull the secret message out of the Sego file. Um, another trick is if you know the technique, you can put a message into a file and see how it's different and see, oh, okay, I, I now know how this, mess this known message got put in. So from that, I can use that on another message that, that was sent by the, by the uh, perpetrator. And, and lastly, you're, you're lucky all the way around. You have the original message, you have uh, the original file, you have what was sent, and you have the tool. You're, you really score then if you've got all three of them. Um, there are commercial tools for detecting steganography. NCASE is one of the premier forensic programs out there, um, and it has a steganographic detection capability in it. Um, I Look Investigator is another program for um, determining whether or not something has got steganography applied to it. Remember I talked about the Outguest program for um, hiding a file, hiding a message inside a file. That was created by a fellow named Niels Provost. Um, he has a program called Steg Detect for detecting secret messages stuffed away in JPEG files. Um, now it's pretty clever. It uses statistics and statistical methods to determine whether or not there is a uh, possibility of a steganographic uh, method used on a file. And as I pointed out, uh, Provost also created Outguess, which was used by Cicada 303 and is a uh, steganographic uh, creation program. Um, Provost claims that Outguess is undetectable by steganographic analysis. Even his program, Steg Detect, no, that's, that's kind of blowing your own horn on that one. Um, okay, the, the gaming market and the, the, the PC market has kind of tanked lately. People aren't buying new PCs that much, and they're not buying ridiculously expensive graphics cards. So there's currently a glut of graphics cards on the market, which is great because you can use those GPUs for other things like determining whether or not there is any kind of steganographic nonsense going on in a file. Uh, you can buy numerous graphics cards and do all sorts of wonderful stuff in parallel uh, for doing statistical analysis. Um, there are quite a few papers on this out there right now using GPUs. 
to do this rather than supercomputers. Um, it is still somewhat in the very early stage of use. Um, for instance, um, it is what I call in the DIY, do-it-yourself, and the WIP work-in-progress stage. If you go out there and look for this kind of stuff, uh, you'll notice something that the countries where this kind of research is going on happens to be countries that are fearful of their citizenry using secret techniques to communicate, like China, and oddly enough, Britain. Yes, the British are doing lots of research in this area. It's no surprise to me that the Chinese work. Uh, the Chinese have ban banned encryption. Uh, so that leaves, if you want to do secret communication, steganography. So they're really big into using GPUs to look for this stuff. Um, another way for uh, detecting steganography, steg expose. Uh, it works on... Uh, portable network graphics and bitmap graphics. Um, it, um, it will do a whole directory at a time. And what it does is it gives you a statistical probability that there is steganography used in a file. Um, a new one that has recently come out uh, that's open source for steg analysis is Aletheia. Um, haven't had a chance to play with it yet. Um, here is a nice link on GitHub for, do, for all sorts of steganographic tools for doing steganalysis. Yes, sir? No, no, no. I'm oh, okay. Okay. Um, in summary, steganography has been around through all sorts of human history, uh, going back four to four or five hundred BC. Um, it has been a tool in warring parties, uh, even into modern times, before the advent of um, modern day computers. It was all based on concealing mess messages through uh, things like invisible ink, microdots. Um, another, way, another way that, that uh, secret messages were, were uh, transmitted. Uh, during times of war, newsprint is very expensive and, and hard to get, uh, and is in short supply. So, leaving newspapers around for somebody to just pick up and read was not that uncommon. So what they would do is, um, to encode a secret message, they would take a pen and poke holes through letters on the newsprint page. <coughs> the next person to come along picks it up, reads the newspaper, and gets the secret message looking for where the holes are poked and then puts it in the trash, or takes it with them. Um, another interesting way of, of uh, the pre-digital way of, uh, of encoding uh, using steganography. With uh, steganography and digital computers, uh, it's not just something that's just available to nation states or warring parties. The average man on the street can now get high quality steganography and uh, use it for any number of purposes. Um, it is still used by nation states. It has been discovered by cyber criminals, mafia, uh, various uh, APT, advanced persistent threat characters in China, Iran, Russia, whatnot. Um, there are lots of programs for, steg for steganography. Um, there aren't that many for steg analysis because it's hard to do. Um, you can fool the human eye, you can fool the human ear easy, even easier. Um, and the whole purpose of steganography is to make something look normal. And how can you tell if something is abnormal? Um, cheap GPUs is making it faster and less error prone. And that's all I have. Thank you. Questions? Ah, questions. Yes, sir. So all these techniques are susceptible to corruption, though, right? So if you take the JPEG and you, you know, re-save it, then your steganography has then been wiped. Um, or yes. any other well, doing... Well, okay. For, 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 along those lines, 
um, if you encode something into, say, a JPEG, a JPEG specifically, and then you turn it into a PNG or a bitmap, and then turn that back into a JPEG, your message is gone. Right. Um, that's because JPEGs are not lossless. But, uh, yeah, that's one way that you can get rid of the message, or somebody can fog the message up right. in, in transit. Um, but, yeah, um, it, is, it is not perfectly lossless. You, you had a question, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so, I know that uh, a lot of high-end uh, color printers uh, put a yellow dot pattern down the middle of their prints so that, you know, if you print money, the treasury can buy are any of these, or do any of these, actually encode a message that is retrievable by scanning it? I don't know if I'm asking. I that. I, I know what you're asking, and I I don't know that to be a fact, um, but um, along the in, in a similar fashion, I used to work for Xerox Corporation. That's how I learned that. Okay, I used to work for Xerox. And at the government's insistence, they did something you, with the print with, with, with the xerography. If you photograph, if you take a Xerox copy of something, and you hold it up and the original to the light, they don't exactly match up. The reason why is fo is uh, photocopying money. That's the reason, and, and the government asked Xerox to do that. So that, that, that is slight, they are, they are slightly off. They're, they don't make a perfect matchup. And that's the reason why, is that you could photograph, uh, zero, uh, a photocopy. I, 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 I'm not saying the word Xerox, because when I worked at Xerox, they taught you, do not use the word Xerox to mean copy. You use that and we will beat you up. <laughs> uh, they don't want the same thing that happened to Xerox as what happened to Aspirin. But yeah, um, you could photocopy a, a dollar bill and then run it through one of the, the, the Coke machines that accepts dollar bill and get a Coke out. That, that's the reason why. Yes, sir. Uh, it goes a little further than that. A couple years ago, I did a tour of the Mint, and then where it was allowed to take pictures of this huge size of that screen, dollar bill. Took a picture of it for my vacation photos, but when I went to print it for my album, my software, my photo software, refused to print it. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even though it was it was cockeyed, mm -hmm. I had a picture of a display and everything, mm -hmm. it, it recognized what it was and would refuse to print it. What software? No. Just curious. Uh, that was uh, Paint Shop Pro. Yeah. Some um, of the smarter yeah. scanners these days won't actually let you scan a dollar bill. I used to use that as a test yeah. for mm -hmm. testing out a new scanner. Yeah. Yeah. Even though it was, you know, it, it was not like, <laughs> super life size, yeah. it was just yeah. trapezoidal yeah. from the angle and other stuff in the element. There was something in there that it still recognized mm -hmm. that it wouldn't let me print. Yeah. Well, when we got we got a DocuColor Xerox DocuColor 40 about 10 years ago. And uh, of course, it's got the thing that says "Don't copy money." So the first thing I find, <laughs> and it would it copy it, but it came out in black and white. And so I was trying to figure out was it the size or the percentage of green. So if I turned it and just put a quarter of it on, then it would come out. But that's yeah. the guy who told me, yeah, if you had, hadn't used a new five, it would have shut down yeah. because it had an image of all the currency mm -hmm. at time of manufacture. And he's the one who said, "Watch this," and he had a blank color copy. We went over to the light table. And he's got the loop, and he's like, look, there it is. And there's yeah. a pattern of yellow dots right down the center. Yeah. Yeah. It's got the serial number and the uh, brand. Okay. Uh, yeah, this must have been built into the software yeah. to recognize yeah. what what I was bringing up as an image to edit. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah there, there's, yeah. Again, again, more steganography. It's like yes, a sir. Yeah. Are you familiar with Digimark photo protection? Um... That's I've heard. Yeah. I've, yeah. Uh, yeah. This is uh, uh, this is for watermarking uh, photos, and that that's a. I I, I thought about putting something about watermarking in in, in the presentation, but uh, I decided, well, okay, maybe that's uh, that's going down a little bit too deep, and uh, I wanted to hit hit more high points. But yeah, I've heard of of that, and that's a that is a uh, th that is a, a putting a digital watermark. On photos, uh, sound files. Uh, Sony's notorious for that. Is there an open source free software version? Because Digimark is fairly pricey if you have a lot of photos to do. Um, I don't think it's that. 
I don't think it's that expensive. You have to license but, based on how many photos you're doing. Yeah. But I but but as it is an option or something. But yeah. but, I'm, I'm but uh, it's an option. But you you can't use it unless you subscribe. Right. But you right. really don't have to. But you don't really have to worry about paying for it uh, if you want to use something like Stig Suite, and you could put in a copyright notice with that. But then again, the minute they copy it and they recompress it or, or we change the size, if, it, if it's gone, how are you going to prove that? Well, it it, yeah, it's. It's not perfect, but uh, the, the question is, is how uh, are you interested in catching 90% of the people or are you interested in catching all of them or um, how, how, how far down the rat hole did you, did you want to go? Yes, ma'am. I'm just interested in how you're applying this from a security operations perspective um, in terms of detection, response, and analysis. What, what are you seeing in that regard? Um, Again, it, it, the example that I gave you, yeah. uh, where you're given a forensic image and you start probing it, and um, uh, well, the, the 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 most the most likely cases is going to be a Windows PC, and you look in in the directory, uh, their 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 pictures directory, and you find all of these photos, all of these uh, image files that are essentially the same looking, but they have slightly different characteristics. And you can look at the properties of the individual files. For instance, uh, how many pixels by how many pixels. And you see, well, they're basically all the same in that characteristic. Uh, the properties of the, uh, uh, click on the properties, and that will tell you that kind of information. But they're all the same. They all look the same. Um, but they're, they're, they're all, so, but they're not the same size. They don't have the same MD5 checksum. Why, why is that? And then you start, um, uh, looking around in, in other places, and you start seeing that they have uh, that they have put steganographic software on it through looking at the registry keys. Um, but most, mostly, what you're trying to do is you're you're trying to establish that some kind of malfeasance has happened in the first place, um, because steganography is very hard to uh, say. Well, okay, this. This is the secret message inside the inside there, or they've encapsulated a, an image inside another another image. You you mostly want to make you're you're at the process of e-discovery where you're trying to establish that something has gone on. Yeah, you're at the point you've already got an image that you're studying or a set of files you're studying. Yeah, right. right. I'm interested in detection. Yeah. Uh, any earlier than that that you. Might, um, uh, any earlier than that. That's 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 the problem. Is, is that uh, steganography is is to fly under uh, under the radar? Yes, sir. So, so I mean, kind of a follow up to her statement. I mean, it almost sounds like then that from a data exfiltration standpoint, steganography would be a fairly undetectable way to to move data off of like a to bypass like DLP systems, for instance. Uh, that it, yes, yes, it would be a way to bypass DLP systems. Um, but again, you would be able to perhaps get it through um, indirect means. For instance, looking at NetFlows, where it's um, the, the Reader's Digest condensed version of, of the traffic. The source, the destination, the time, and the amount of data transfer. And you would be able to see that maybe, well, and, and sound files and uh, picture files are not small things, unlike Word documents, say, where it might be, well, there's no such thing as a small Word document. But, um, <laughs> but, but typically, Word documents are, are maybe you know, a letter or a resume or something like that. It, that's less than a megabyte. But uh, uh, sound files and uh, picture files, sound files in particular, uh, those can be very large. So you would see lots of traffic outward that, that something is going on that way. So it almost sounds like it makes more sense to, to, from an analysis standpoint, to be proactive to look for metadata rather than actually trying to analyze for it. So right, right, actually look for time. metadata. Now, um, all, of these, all of these files, um, like JPEG and PDFs and all of that, uh, all of those have a very distinctive header in them that says that this is a, even though you may take a JPEG file and rename it to uh, gorgo.txt. It still is identifiable to the operating system 
or and the applications that this is really a JPEG file. So um, you could write snort rules to look at the header and detect that um, uh, you're getting JPEG files being sent out, an abnormal number of JPEG files, or, or bitmap or audio or whatever, something like that. Um, yeah, uh, you, basically an, an indirect technique. Yes, sir? Would it be fair to say that, th that this technique uh, will be uh, used more frequently and become a bigger problem for security? Oh, it's definitely becoming a bigger problem. Yeah, and it sounds like it's, you know, uh, so undetectable and so difficult to handle. It's so it's, difficult it's and I, because um, using uh, something like, um, um, not steak sweet, um, uh, Aletheia, um, where you would or uh, uh, where you would get a probability that there's something hidden in it, uh, because that's what you're looking for. Um, the, by having that higher probability, you think, well, okay, there, there's there's something bizarre going on here. Uh, maybe we need to have Fred go over and have a conversation with Fred over in accounting to explain why he's suddenly able to afford a Lamborghini. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's becoming a, a much more difficult problem uh, for, uh, for security. And, and as this gentleman was talking here, as a way, as a way to, to bypass uh, DLP. You had a question, sir? It, it seems like if you use, like now, it's expensive, but if you use two layers of sticker and off or combining encryption and sticker and autography, you can really screw up statistical uh, detection techniques, I should say. Yes, the combination of the two, of, of first encrypting a file and then hiding that encrypted file inside of uh, some sort of stego image, yeah, that becomes increasingly, that becomes a very hard now, problem. Which makes of, of course, it's problem. expensive in terms of your messages have to be short or you have to have huge files to embed them into. Well, and in the case of huge files, that's going to show up in your network statistics. Um, now, uh, as you mentioned, um, the, uh, your, your message has to end up being rather short. Uh, that get, gets into the, uh, gets past the idea of using just ciphers and gets into using codes as well, where you take a phrase that ordinarily would mean nothing, like, for instance, the name of a Jack Benny movie he made, The Horn Blows at Midnight. Well, you encrypt that and put that into a file, uh, uh, steganize that into a file, and then email that out. What does the horn blows at midnight mean? Well, it means something to the person on the other end, but even if you could extract it out, it means nothing to you. Send it in Navajo. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, um, I, I used to know somebody who was a um, who was an, uh, an American had American Indian roots, and she had a, a poster on her wall of the Indian alphabet, and it had characters in it that were not Roman characters. They were Roman characters that had things done to them. But yeah, that, that becomes a, a, a problem there. Um, yes, sir? But to the perspective of, of fighting against this kind of behavior, this is more of an evidentiary problem than a detection problem. Yeah. yeah. Right, because the, the, the rate of data inside any psychographic message is, I mean, the, the message is much smaller than the carrier. Exactly, and that's, and so that's, what, that's, what, this, the, that's what you were asking about, was how do you detect it? And, Really, it's not so much detection as it is e-discovery, where you're you're looking for the presence of some kind of malfeasance going on. And, and the, the volume and quantity of uh, photos and imagery that is being exchanged is already extraordinary and going yeah. through the roof. So I don't even think, from a DLP perspective, yeah. it's going to Yes, sir. That, that was my follow-up question about the mark. One of the things that they do is they, when, once you add their watermark to your photographs, they periodically scour the big photo-sharing websites, and if they find 
photo with your watermark, they let you know, and then you mm -hmm. take action. So I'm curious, like, how are they doing? Like, what if you wanted your steganography to be detectable, like they're doing? I assume, how would you do that? Oh, that is a very good question. How would you fake steganography? Oh, well, okay. Uh, what you could do is you could do it. You you could do it stupidly. Okay. Uh, for the, well, there, it's it's invisible to the human eye apparently, but mm -hmm. they somehow know how to look for it and be able to detect when your photo has been used um, or tampered with. The watermark is not hidden. The, the watermark it, the watermark itself is not is not steganized. Um, to, to my knowledge, um, I, I, I thought it was um, some sort of, of plain text. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I've, I've not really looked into the, the watermarking area of, the, of it really well because I, I, don't have, I don't have that problem. But yeah, um, yeah, the watermarking, don't know about that one. I, I thought about put, putting something about that in here, but that, that just sort of went into to a rat hole and I didn't really I really didn't think there'd be that much interest in, in, in watermarking. I guess that there is, at least at the at the consumer level. Yes, sir. I was sir. actually just looking at um, invisible watermarking for, for photographs uh, a couple of days ago, so if you want to chat about that afterwards, I'm totally... totally okay, cool. that is interesting. Not, not that I'm an expert by any means, but like, I was just mm -hmm. looking into it a few days ago. Yes, sir. So, uh, has there ever been a case of uh, an, an executable being put into steganography where a launch once this opened up? Um, there, there appears to be, yeah, um, well, not, not so much an executable as it is a, um, uh, one of the cases that I was looking at fairly recently uh, where someone uh, was using it for um, um, uh, fishing kinds of stuff. What it is is that it's a a byte stream of of uh, executable code gets injected into a PowerShell instance, and then that is executed. Um, I, I'm not aware executable. I'm not aware really of of executables being done that way because um, um, L format for for Linux and what the uh, um, uh, what is uh, uh, on Windows PE uh, portable execution format PEF? Um, th those are very um, special, specially crafted files, and they have to be very rigidly uh, uh, worked on. Um, so I I'm not aware of, of using e exe files for okay. anything like that. Um, but that byte stream instance is the closest that I know of. Uh, generally, everybody uses uh, sound files or, or picture files, uh, mostly because they're they're very readily available. Um, that, those pictures of the Terminator, um, I just sucked off the, those down from uh, the Register.uk because I know that they like to do. I know they use that particular um, uh, one a lot for whenever they're talking about uh, what they call rise of the machines, machines <laughs> taking over. Um, so th I thought, well, that's a good one. It, it's small, and I can use that one. I'll use that one. Yes? I know the average user is just going to do a, oh, well, picture that's easily, but does that have something to do with the fact that uh, those formats have a lot of uh, looseness in them, there's a lot of zeros, they're easily compressed, there's that, that's lots true. of yeah. spare space. Yeah, there's lots of spare space. Um, uh, for, for instance, uh, um, oh, let's see, which? Uh, one, one format, um, uh, GIFs. Yeah, GIFs use internal compression. So they, they compress stuff out. Uh, you saw the trick I used where uh, I, I, I fogged you over by using compression on the destination file so that it looks smaller than the original and you would bypass that one and go for the second one and figure that, that it's bigger. It's got to have the secret message in it. So that, that's, that's one trick that you can use. And, and like I say, there's, there's all um, 
most of these programs like PDF readers, they only look for what they know to look for. So you can put stuff in there and, and hide stuff that way. Yes, sir. Many years ago, uh, you used to transmit images over the internet uh, by encoding them, in, uh, going from the, the, the code in the, in the picture to a, a text code. Mm -hmm. And typically they were split up into many parts, and you had to think, if I recall, it was UU encode and UU decode. Yeah, there's, there's if, that. Uh, if there... you did that, would that preserve the, the secret message? Um, that would probably preserve the secret message. Um, well, okay, for, uh, along those lines, and, and being able to transmit stuff across slow internet lines, because um, uh, in lesser developed countries, they do internet over ham radio. Yeah, they do actually do internet over ham radio. Um, there is this wonderful Unix utility, and, and Linux utility too, called Split. Um, what you do is you have, you have a big file that you want to transmit, but you, you don't want to transmit, it, but you've got slow lines for whatever, whatever reason, like, like internet over, over ham radio. You use split, and you can split it up into um, however big you want. Uh, you can give, say, say, 1K chunks. And then you send each one of those, and then you use the split utility once you've got all of them, and it puts it all back together. And it is lo split is lossless. Split is lossless, so if you wanted to do something like that, yeah, you could do it that way. And the, the nice thing about split is, is that if somebody didn't get one of the files, you can send that file again. So it's sort of, it's sort of like having TCP where you've got acknowledgments for what you've gotten and what you haven't gotten and retransmission, but it's at a much higher level because it's now at the protein level rather than at the DNA level rather than at the machine level. But yeah, the split is lossless. I've used it for other other things where um, I've I've not been able to send something that was too big and I cut it up and and it is lossless because what I would do is I'd do an MD5 sum on the beginning file and then once I got everything reconstructed, I'd do an MD5 sum and the checksum and the MD5 sums were the same. So life is good. Life is good. So split is lossless. Um, but as I as I mentioned. Um, some formats are not lossless when you transform them into another image and then turn it back. JPEG to PNG back to JPEG, your, your steganographic message is lost. It's gone. Uh, there was a question back in the back. Yes, sir. software for a PDF. So if I'm selling like a digital PDF but I want it to uniquely identify the, the purchaser? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, there, there is a fellow uh, on the internet named D.D.A. Stevens, D.I.D.I.E.R. Stevens. He, he is a master of knowledge about PDFs. Uh, Google for him, and he may his website may have some information on that. Uh, he has a lot of uh, uh, stuff on his website about uh, forensics on uh, on PDFs and being able to pull information out of PDFs. So I, I would give his website a try, since he is the ma he he knows more probably knows more about PDFs than Adobe. DDA Stevens, D D like D D A, it's like a French spelling. It's a French spelling. D I D I, D -I, -D -I E R Stevens. Yeah, uh, I've used some of his uh, uh, PDF programs, and he's he he's a master of, of PDFs. Um, other other questions, was, yes, sir. Went, you sort of mentioned it in passing, but just being able to detect stegon like steganography uh, in audio, it's it, like like our eyes can't see it, the ears can't hear it either. No, in, in fact, um, ears are worse than eyes. Yeah. Um, for instance, um, internet radio is typically done over UDP, so. Um, you lose a couple of frames in in that transmission over UDP. Your ear can't tell it. Um, most most people's frequency response cuts off somewhere around 4,000 to 5,000 hertz, and everything above that is just harmonics. That's why we can get away with having 
these things uh, that don't have really good audio quality yeah. uh, speakers in them uh, because um, our, our frequency response of our ears um, cuts off, uh, starts dropping off above, above 5,000 hertz. Human speech is somewhere between 30 and 300 hertz. Um, uh, if you if you have a re it used to be that if you had a really good sound system and a really good a really good recording and you put on the 2001 album where it starts out with also Spark Zarathustra, there is an organ tone in there at 16 hertz. Um, we really can't hear it that well. Some people might be able to. But all we can do is hear the harmonic of it at 32 hertz. But it's a very deep, if you put on headphones, you can hear the rumble at that point. But yeah, the most sound files um, don't, don't uh, are, are even, have even, we, we worry about fidelity on those even less than we do audio, uh, uh, video files. So how does somebody, um, how does um, provided, well, how do they decrypt it? Yeah. Well, they have to know the algorithm that it was used to encrypt it in the, to put it in there in the first place. So they're, they're examining the file? They're, they're examining the file. And um, as I mentioned, uh, the most common technique is to use the least significant bit substitution. Um, now, if you, as a general rule, it is not a good idea to write your own cryptography. It is also a good idea not to write your own steganography because if you just took a, a video file and encrypted your, and, and steganized your, um, your input where you went through and just changed the least significant bit right down the line, um, that's going to be uh, kind of silly uh, because that's going to be fairly easy to recognize, relatively speaking. Um, so what these steganographic programs do is they have an algorithm by which they scatter the LSBs that they've changed throughout the whole file. And if you don't know that algorithm that they used, you can't, you, you can't get it back. And different steganographic programs use different algorithms for hiding it. So although you may be, you, somebody may have used SteGSuite to steganize their, their message, um, if they try to use SteGHide to get it back, chances are getting it back pretty low because they use different algorithms. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you for coming.